And I didn't know what they were at the time. And all of a sudden I'd see one of these, we're talking spirits here, so spirits coming across the room towards me at 50 miles an hour. They weren't walking towards me. They were coming right through people and right through desks, right at me. And they seemed to have like really unfriendly and wild eyes. Welcome back. I'm here with Jeffrey Seelman. Jeff, welcome. Thank you, Sean. Very happy to be on your show. Look, I think we have a guest already. <laughs> and this is my cat, Knight. And usually she stays out of the picture, but sometimes she just likes to get involved a little bit. So, yeah, well, that's probably a good thing. Yeah. Anyway, so you run a business right now where you clear homes, negative energy offices, buildings, and things like that. But that's not where you started. Where you started is related to that. But can you just talk a little bit about your background and your ability to see kind of beyond what most people see? Sure. I was born September 29th, 1959, which was a very interesting year. And I right away was able to, my in my earliest memories anyway, when uh, maybe 1963 or so, I was able to see spirits and they were most visible to me when I was in the classroom, starting with elementary school here in the United States. So I would be sitting in my classroom and I would see, besides the students and the teacher, I would see very often three or for other adults that were usually paying very much attention to other students and not me. They were not walking around and looking at things and they seemed to be very much interested in what any one particular student was doing, kind of almost like looking over the shoulder. And also sometimes I would come across some kind of being i didn't know what they were at the time sean and so i didn't know that they were spirits but i later on it was like okay because i asked the teachers but sometimes also in the classroom there would be one of these adults that were very visual to me they didn't look any different than any other being i did not really see through them so much or anything like that they weren't shadows they looked very much like you and i that I would see an occasional being that was walking around the classroom that seemed to be very aware and on some kind of business of their own that I felt was very uncomfortable, meaning that they seemed to be projecting negative feelings. I was very much into feelings and I was very sensitive to that at the time. And they also would look at me where the other spirits or as I now know to be spirits, would be paying attention to the people in the classroom and especially like one particular student. And there would be maybe one occasionally moving around that seemed to be paying attention to everybody. And they would look at me because I'd be turning around looking and watching these things happening and they would see me looking at them and then they would essentially very often come after me very quickly they'd move towards me and I would be terrified. My mother at that time was saying things to me about that I would be able to say, when is grandmother going to call? And I would say, well, grandma's going to call tomorrow morning at 8.30 a.m. or 8.45 or 8.47. And lo and behold, that she would call at that time. Now, I thought all of these things were normal. And I thought everybody could see these things. And so I'd report it to the teachers, Sean, and my parents. My mother seemed to handle all of this really well and also find the phone call thing to be of great use. But it also frightened my teachers greatly. It's like, you're seeing things? And I said, yeah, there are other people in this classroom, like adults as well as children, and I don't know who they are. I was only five years old or so. 
and going on six, that kind of thing. And they said, no, we don't see anything. And so it was real problematic for me. And I became frightened when I was four years old that I was sleeping and I must have heard something and I shot up in bed. This is one of my first memories, by the way. And I shot up in bed and what I saw at the foot of my bed were two what I thought were two very, very large eyes that were glowing, but not in my face. It wasn't, it was like almost self-illuminating. I would have not have used those terms back then. We're talking 1963. We didn't have the technology for these kind of things. And so I thought it was like some kind of giant spider or something because I've been watching cartoons and movies and I thought, wow, there's a monster in my bedroom. But I always kept the door open a little bit as many children do. And so there's some light coming through. And as my eyes cleared, no, I'm kind of punched up in bed and I'm looking. And then I realized that I saw essentially two small, which had to be aliens because they simply didn't look anything like us. And they were wearing what I would at the time thought were the same thing. And essentially I thought maybe uniforms of some kind and what I was looking at essentially, as far as the lights go, was some kind of technology that they were wearing on their chests. And I recognized it right away as some kind of technology. And this was not something I had seen before. That the spirits or whatever I was seeing in classrooms, they were not wearing any kind of technology. And I was very much into this kind of stuff, even at a young age, for whatever reason. Now, both of these beings were at the foot of my bed in the, these uniforms or whatever were jet black. And whether they read my mind in some way or they could just sense how I was feeling, is I was very frightened. I really at first thought that I was dealing with one kind of thing that had come into my bedroom. Then my eyes cleared then I could see it was actually two beings that were smaller than the average adult human being. One of them had actually moved around to the side of my bed, farthest away from the door. And then I knew right away that I said, wow, I, there are two aliens in my bedroom. But I didn't get any sense, Sean, of any kind of danger, that there was no attack. Nobody was messing around with the technology on their chest. It was just whether they were wearing them or they were somehow stuck to their uniforms. I wasn't quite sure. I couldn't see very clearly. I could see their faces and what they looked like, and they did not look human at all. And so this went on for a while until I finally got nerve enough to run. I did not feel in any kind of danger, but I simply ran out of my room and into my parents' room, which was down the hall. And I said, Mom, there are aliens in my bedroom. And she came running out right away. You know, it's kind of interesting that she always believed everything that I said and not because she was gullible, but I just think that she knew that I was a little bit different. And all these experiences that I reported in school and all these things and the ability to tell her when things were going to happen in the future. And so she believed me. She came running out and into my bedroom and they were gone. And one interesting thing, we lived in a smaller home at the time. And it was just a one level in a basement and there was only one way out, either through a window or going by my parents' room. And she came out running very quickly and we didn't see anything pass by the door of her bedroom. I was looking. And so I was kind of like, mom, there are aliens in my bedroom. I think I would have seen them. So I don't think they ever came past that room, how they got out of my bedroom, I'll never know. Looking back, and I had many concepts of what I think happened and what that was about, but essentially they were able to get out of the house without detection. You quick questions. So going back to your classroom experience, when you would see these entities, what would they look like? Would they just be just as clear as a regular human adult, or was there something different about their appearance? to your eyes? It's a good question. There was nothing unusual about them. They looked very much like human adults. I didn't see any children. 
I was always adults, that they were full adult size and we were just little kids. And the only thing I noticed about, and also that they were, I did not see through them. When the United States and China clash, the world will never be the same, especially when forces beyond reality threaten to intervene. What if the United States went to war with the People's Republic of China? How would these rivals fight for supremacy on land, sea, air, and across the stochastic streams of time? What wonder weapons would be unleashed? What horrors would emerge from the irradiated sludge of the South China Sea? What heroes would rise and forever change the course of history? Tread into the deepest and darkest dimensions of the multiverse, gaze through a kaleidoscope of fractured realities, and bear witness to the disturbing visions of World War III from today's greatest minds in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Weird World War, China. Available now from Bain Books at Bain.com. That they were very, seemed to, be, to me to be very much just there. The only thing that I recognized that was different about them was they seemed to be wearing different kinds of clothing than adults were wearing, meaning that seemed to be clothing that might have been from another time, but it wasn't from a specific time, meaning that each of these beings that I saw were wearing things that I had recognized maybe from movies that I had been watching things that people might have worn in the 1800s or the 1930s or 40s and they weren't necessarily just wearing things from like 1963 or 64. and i thought that was unusual i didn't really know what they were i did not identify them as spirits because i didn't know what spirits were but they look to me as spirits do today when i see them i see them very clearly and I see everything that they wear, and I see how they generate their appearance. And so to me, I just thought they were actually people in the classroom. I did not think when, that they were spirits. I didn't know what a spirit was. How did you figure out that they were different than everybody else, if they seemed to be just as solid as everybody else? Like, when did that realization come to you? When I reported to the teachers that who are these people in the classroom, and there weren't many of them, and they seemed to be really intent, kind of leaning over the shoulders of my classmates who I knew, almost like they were studying their homework. And so they'd really be very intent and not looking at me, not paying any attention to me. And so I reported these things to the teachers, like, who are these people? There are no people, Jeffrey. They're just your classmates, and we're not seeing this happening. And then I became frightened because, because I'd even asked my classmates, did you feel anybody standing behind you looking down at your assignment at the time? Did you see any of this stuff? No. And it, it really, I started to become very frightened of the whole thing. It was not a pleasant time in my life because nobody else was seeing this and at first I thought that everybody was seeing this stuff, that this was something that was normal. And it turned out that it wasn't, and nobody was seeing what I was seeing. And my parents also had not reported any of this, that they'd seen anything, because I'd seen them other places as well, including my own home, looking at me and paying some attention to me as I was growing up, but they had never seen anything. And so, what had happened was, was that I was losing friends and also scaring the teachers and also scaring, especially my father, who was a good man, but he didn't seem to like any of this. My mother seemed to find all of this very fascinating. My parents were both college educated people. My dad was ex-military and very logical people. They were not religious people. And they said that they didn't see anything. But my mother seemed to understand a little bit more that I was not lying or that I was not hallucinating because I would describe things in really great detail to the teachers, to my classmates. This went over really badly, Sean, with my teachers and classmates, especially. I could handle the stuff at home. They didn't do anything to me at home. But the idea is that teachers were frightened of what I was saying. And it was like, well, maybe you should even like 
leave the classroom for a while because you're upsetting people. Because I'd say, what are these beings? And my classmates reacted even worse. To advertise on Throw Glass Darkly, email throwglassdarkly ads at gmail.com. Like, what are you talking about? And I was losing friends fast. And I was trying to make friends at the time. And it just was all falling apart. And fortunately, I was never given any drugs or anything. I was tested a few years later by a hospital for psychic ability. I don't know what they called that at the time, but it was an overnight type thing with electrodes on my head and all that kind of thing at a local hospital. But I was never given any medication or anything. They never felt I needed any. I don't know what they thought, really. The teachers, I know that something I told my mother later on in life, she died 22 years ago, but I had told her that one of the things that they did when I was young was whenever somebody would throw up, which little kids do quite often, and I went to a pretty big school, elementary school, we're talking maybe in the third, fourth grade, here in the United States, as we call it, third, fourth, fifth grade, that anytime anybody threw up, usually in a hallway or something, as kids do, they would simply call me down to the office and say, hey, Jeffrey, do you want to clean this up? And so I would say, sure, because anything to get me out of that classroom, because not only was I feeling spirits, Sean, but I was also feeling huge amounts of emotional energy I had all these feelings around me. I could feel all my classmates. I could feel the teacher's emotions. And even worse, I could feel emotions that seemed to come from nowhere. That probably was stuff that was already in the classroom. And it was really driving me crazy. I was in distress. I was very uncomfortable in the classroom. I would stare at the clock. I would stare out the windows. I could barely pay attention to what the teachers were teaching. All I wanted to do was get out of there. And it really wasn't so much to do with the spirits or whatever I thought they were. I didn't know at the time, I was very young, but also the feelings I got of emotional energy. And so when they brought me downstairs and said, hey, will you clean up this puke, this vomit? I'd be like, sure, because it didn't bother me. Anything to get me out of the classroom. And I think they really knew it. Why would they call me of all the hundreds of students? And they have janitors. Right, because they, were, they obviously weren't picking on you. Like they, they knew you would be happy to do it, probably. I, I right? went to a somewhat affluent school. Mm -hmm. They had plenty of janitors, and that was their job. My mother freaked out totally when I told her this a few years before she died that I was even doing this. She goes, I would have called the school. You shouldn't be doing that kind of stuff. And I thought, no, no, mom, I told her. And I was an adult. I was... 45 years old when I told her this stuff. And I said, mom, they were doing me a favor. I was more than happy to clean this up and it didn't make me want to throw up or anything. And I didn't go back to class right away and it didn't bother them. So I'd clean this stuff up and I'd just go sit outside for about an hour and then return to the classroom. So I think they were actually trying to get me out of there. There's somebody vomited, let's call Jeffrey Seelman, hook him down and clean it up. I didn't think it was because janitors didn't want to do it. I think it was because they just didn't want me in there. And the teachers had reported to people who were higher up, the authority figures, that I was wildly uncomfortable in the classroom. And I would just sit there, just kind of looking out the windows, like I said, and at the clock, counting down the minutes of how long I had to be in this place I was so uncomfortable in. Now, you mentioned that some particular students got more attention than others. In hindsight, do you have any theories about why that was and what that was? Yes. And when I look back on what was probably going on, like I look back on why the aliens were in my bedroom as well, looking back at things, the teachers would give us assignments. And so we'd be working on things silently. And I really believed because they were studying that they were actually transmitting information to these students of maybe how to go about figuring out mathematical problems or history or whatever we were supposed to be studying. 
and that they were actually helping these people, much like the concept of a spirit guide. Because they seemed to be completely intent on what the students were doing, and they were essentially leaning over and almost seemed to have their arm on their shoulders, touching them, although the students didn't seem to feel it. So it was very common for them to be not paying attention to me, but just kind of leaning over and looking at the homework. They were much taller. The kids were all sitting down at the desks, my classmates, and they'd be kind of looking down and doing nothing else. And so I think they were just helping them with their homework and understanding how to go about figuring out some of these mathematical problems and learning how to write. They were teaching us how to write English and all of these different things, and they were there to help. And I didn't get any bad vibrations for them. The only thing that was happening as far with spirits that upset me was sometimes there were spirits in there or whatever at the time that seemed to be highly aware that I could see them. And they would come at me. They'd start to not walk towards me, but float towards me fast. What do Real they look fast. Like? People, mm. I mean, just like you and I, except for that they looked unfriendly, like their eyes looked to me like, hey, I got a live one here. This guy can see me and I'm going to scare him. And I didn't know what they were at the time. And all of a sudden I'd see one of these, we're talking spirits here, so spirits coming across the room towards me at 50 miles an hour. They weren't walking towards me. They were coming right through people and right through desks, right at me. And they seemed to have like really unfriendly and wild eyes, kind of like, I'm going to scare you. And it worked. And there were times where I'd go running out of the classroom when this happened. I would not sit there, but I'd run because I didn't know what they were. And what and about the students that didn't have a spirit standing behind them? I didn't know what to make of it. I never saw a classroom where there were any more than maybe three or four of these beings working with these students. And they didn't seem to go from student to student. It always seemed to be that they would appear and then they'd be looking down to me, not at the student, but at what they were working on at their desk. And it never really changed. Everybody didn't have one of these spirits and it was not always the same people either. And okay. so it was just like maybe three or four people and they didn't really seem to pay any attention. There were a couple of times I remember where they might have turned around and looked at me, but they would just kind of look at me and then look away. I just feel like they didn't want to frighten me. They weren't really frightening me. I, I didn't really know what they were. I thought everybody could see these things. And so for me, it was kind of like, well, I don't know who they are or what they are. And it was really the ones, and it was only usually one, but, and this did not happen every day, where essentially they would recognize that I could see them and that they would come after me. They'd simply try to scare me. They'd come at me at a higher rate of speed than a normal human being could walk or jump or anything like that which really scared me. One minute they're on the other side of the classroom and the next minute they're right in front of me and usually I would just run out of the classroom at the time, which was not good for the classmates or the teachers and run into the boys' room. Was there anything different about these students that these entities typically appeared around? Like, did they have higher grades? Were they more intuitive? Did you notice any patterns like that in hindsight? No, no. And it mm -hmm. wasn't always the same students. And so there seemed to be no rhyme or reason to what they were doing. I wasn't quite sure what they were doing, but just knowing that what teachers would do is that when a student asked for help and would raise their hand at the time that the teacher would usually kind of go behind them a little bit and look down at their homework and say, okay, you're not doing this mathematical problem right and whatever, or you need to this, do this to make letters properly. Uh, at that time, they were teaching us cursive, which I don't think they do anymore. And so we were no, studying some of strange. that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, no, 
that didn't seem to be any particular students and also it was different kinds of students but i also noticed that the students didn't react at all to them but i had the feeling that they were somehow communicating something to the students that's the only idea that i had is that they were helping them with their assignment in some way did you ever experience one of these similar entities doing the same for you no hmm. no i seem to be quite left alone probably out of mercy <laughs> because when the teachers said to me that there's no other adult in this classroom there's nobody standing behind jimmy over there i started to become frightened it's like you're not seeing this i'm seeing this no there's nobody there jeffrey there's not three adults in the classroom it's just me at the front of the classroom in the desk sitting here at the desk i was really perplexed it was like wait a minute you're not seeing this my classmates i would talk to and say who's standing behind you who's helping you with your homework type of thing what are you talking about jeffrey and this day do you, do you still see entities in the same way or has it dissipated is there a way for you to more easily filter them out or tell which is which yes what happened was is that i started to lose friends and i started to scare teachers and so i determined that the best thing for me to do is to let it all go not report what i was seeing it was having a very negative effect upon the teachers and my classmates i started to be isolated and so what happened was one summer maybe when i was in third grade i might have been eight years old or something like that or somewhere in there i had just simply decided when i went back to school as they changed classrooms and stuff and people were coming in from different classrooms and all that that i was not going to speak about it again that i was going to deny what i saw because people were no longer talking to me Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, okay, when I go back this fall to school, I am not going to pay any more attention to any of this. And I'm not going to report to the teachers that I see anything. And if they ask me, I'll say, no, I don't see anything at all. Because I'm not getting anywhere with this. And evidently, everybody is not seeing what I see. But that didn't necessarily help the situation only because I didn't know what they were it didn't stop happening and when there was this one spirit and it was different spirits or different whatever they were i thought they would still come at me so it really didn't end the only thing that ended was me talking about it and all of a sudden i had lots of friends i became captain of the football team as time went on even in grade school we had like a flag football thing as they call it the captain of the baseball team Everything changed for me once I stopped talking about all of this. And so kids forget quickly. And mm -hmm. I had new teachers each year. And so when I stopped talking about it, it was all over. And that is the way it remained all the way through high school. And after high school, I went into the Air Force. And so I never talked about it again. And even though that I did see these things, and I did start to believe as I started to read things and understand what these things could be is that they probably were spirits, dead people, essentially, that were not lying down in their grave, but actually very active. And so in high school, back in the 1970s, lots of people would go outside and do things like smoke cigarettes or some marijuana. It was a very common mm -hmm. thing. And the teachers really didn't do anything about it. It's the 70s. They would come out yeah. and just say, hey, you kids, you do that off of school grounds. Yeah. The 30 second warning to me. I never talked about it with my classmates, but I would get this warning that a teacher was going to come out of a door or a principal or something like that, or a vice principal. And so eventually what happened was that my classmates in high school would actually bring me out. I never smoked cigarettes, never. Sometimes 
they would bring me outside just as a warning bell. The canary, right? Yeah, yeah. They would just say, "Will you come outside with us, Jeffrey?" Because for some reason, you always seem to know beforehand when a teacher is going to come out these really thick doors. There's no way for anybody to know. You couldn't see in the doors. They had a little window and everything, but you couldn't tell that they were coming. But I could. I would get these feelings, and I would say, "Run." And at first, maybe they didn't, and they learned pretty quickly that I was right. And after a while, they'd invite me out there. And sometimes I'd go out for my own reasons, but listen to Jeffrey. And when Jeffrey said "run," they'd run, and therefore nobody ever got caught. Not that they were going to call the police. They didn't do that at the time. Not that they were going to suspend or expel anybody. They didn't do that as well in the seventies. It was a lot more acceptable, and half the teachers were using marijuana too. Not in the classroom, but they were very positive about it, and they said so. We think it should be legalized, and I don't care what you guys do; just do it off of school grounds. Was kind of their attitude. So, how did you come to terms with this? Like, how were you able to finally figure out what these entities were? And did you ever try to just directly? communicate with one of them i never did I, I never tried to communicate with spirits later on as i was growing up and i was 14 15 16 years old going into high school that they didn't really seem to be paying very much attention to me and so i thought okay what these are are probably people who have passed on in place of wandering around and being lost, that they actually seemed to know exactly what they were doing. And very often what I had to do was turn on kind of like this fog light inside of my head. I, I started to kind of turn it off because I couldn't handle it anymore. I was not frightened of these things so much as I was kind of like, nobody else is seeing them. There's no point in talking about it. I'm going to lose all my friends. And I had a lot of friends. I was a very normal child in a lot of ways. And I said, I don't want to lose all my friends. We were going to these great concerts and everything. We had lots of parties on weekends. And why should I lose all this? Just because I would say to them, hey, I'm seeing things that they're clearly not seeing. And so I could see them, but I started to shut it off where I would simply not pay attention. And I was not seeing spirits everywhere. I don't believe that spirits are walking around everywhere anyway, like going shopping and shopping malls and all of that. Not to say that they might not be in there, but they don't have any money. They certainly weren't making mm -hmm. any purchases. And so I thought, well, I was just kind of coexisting with them. And so I really never talked about it in high school with my classmates ever, not once. They just simply thought, well, Jeffrey's useful for this particular thing, but he's not necessarily strange. He just simply gets a little warning bell in his head. Doesn't mean he can't go to the half barrel party on Friday night. And I had them myself because my parents were divorced when I was 13 years old. And I even had at my home, it was very common back then for people to have very large half barrel parties with several high schools involved, meaning 150, 200 people. The police wouldn't do nothing about it. This is the 1970s. They would never come into somebody's home, even if there were underage people drinking. And nobody was calling the attorneys. It was more of the concept of, hey, you're the one who drank the alcohol, young man. And it's your fault. It's not the parents' fault for allowing the party to happen. Back then, people were not calling attorneys on each other, nor the police. And that's the way it was back in the 1970s. So it was not usual for the police to show up and raid somebody's house. I lived in a very affluent neighborhood. It was not rich, but it was upper middle class. And the police were not going to go and knock on somebody's door, even if there were a million cars parked outside. The law in Wisconsin, I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin at the time, was 18. And so people who were seniors in high school were able to go to bars. And so there was this blurred line happening. They didn't really know what to do about the whole thing. So it was very legal for a senior to have a party with a half bro. 
And very often the parents would buy half barrels at all these different houses. Mm -hmm. So all the stuff was going on. And then I, after high school, I went directly into the Air Force. I spent about five months after that, just having some fun. And then I went into the Air Force because number one, I'm a patriot. I always have been. I felt that I should do my time in the service and that I also wanted to get away from Milwaukee, which at the time was kind of a violent city. It still is in some ways, like any major city, but the police were the ones really doing the violence. They mm -hmm. ruled with an iron fist and they would beat people up for having long hair. At the time the Vietnam War was going on when I was going to high school, and there was a lot of anger in our country about that. And they were blaming young people for not supporting the war. And if you had long hair, and at the time I had long hair, the police who did not have body cams, cameras on, and answered to no one. And there was no drug testing, by the way, for anybody. They didn't have the technology. Mm -hmm. And so the police did what they wanted. The police sold drugs. The police were drunk on the job. And they did nothing but cruise around looking for people to beat up. And it was a very different time. It's not happening today mm -hmm. so much. People might disagree with me on that. But they think that's bad today. When I was growing up, the police were very crooked and were very yeah, much. It's just, it's just the opposite drugs. today. The police can't do anything today. Well, the police were selling people drugs mm -hmm. in large mm -hmm. amounts, even not $10 worth, but pounds. And I was even involved in that. I was selling drugs when I was a kid, only marijuana. And I was only selling it to friends. I was not the high school drug dealer at the corner type guy. I simply had a three beam scale in my basement. My parents were divorced. The concerts back then were $7 and 50 cents. Right. And so you could see bands like Rush and Yes and Genesis and all these different bands and $7 and 50 cents or $5, some were $5 was not a lot of money back even then. And so we were going to concerts every week and would buy 20 tickets and for all of our classmates and we'd sell them and all of that. And it was just very different. It was concerts had not cost, you know, a hundred dollars right. and $150. And so we were going to a lot of concerts back then and a lot of parties and it was very different. I was mostly frightened of the police. I saw the police beat up children, my age, they beat me up to a pulp one time and they caught me in the dark. I was not committing any crimes but they caught me alone one time and they beat me with billy clubs when I was 16 years old, badly. And I'd seen them do this to women as well. Young women, like 16, 14, 15 years old. I wanted to get out of here. And so that's one of the reasons I also joined the Air Force, that I needed to get away from Milwaukee at the time because the police were not our friends. And one of the things that brought a lot of, say, white people and black people and Asian people together when I was growing up back in the 70s is we had a common enemy and it wasn't each other. It was the police. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that were beating people up. People who are white and black and everything were just trying to live their lives and have a good time. And the police were the ones driving around drunk. They were in bars drinking. I was going into bars and I was 14, 15 years old and I would see police in there and they were drinking all their stuff and they were doing drugs and they didn't like us. And if they decided they wanted to mess with us, they did. And there's nothing anybody could do about it. Think about the movie, The French Connection, a movie that might be real popular. That was real popular at the time. I thought it was a horrible movie because one of the things that they showed in that particular movie was the abuse of the police. I went to see it at the theater when it came out. My, my father took me. He couldn't get into R-rated movies then unless you snuck in. But the idea that the police would go in to any place they wanted to and say, hands on the bar to citizens, you know, to regular people, but not just drug bars or something, any place and say, put your hands on the bar and they'd frisk you and maybe check your ID. Not that that really did any good much. A lot of people didn't even carry IDs back then. They really weren't asking. They would say, are you 18? No, I'm 19. Okay. As long as you had money, you could get in. And it was very different back then. So I went into the Air Force and I can tell you when I was in the Air Force that I'd never discussed with anybody 
that any of this had ever happened or that I was able to see sometimes spirits. And then so that was that was four years of me not talking about it as well. Never even told my best friends, not at all, you know, my comrades. Well, and how did you return to it? After I got out of the service, I was studying self-help concepts. And I, unfortunately, the things I learned in the Air Force were not really very relatable to the outside world. And as far as jobs go. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of lost a little bit when I got out and I said, look, I'm not a religious person, but I started to study religions. I started to study good and evil. I was doing a lot of reading. I would go to libraries, university libraries, and I don't know if you can do this anymore, but I mean, I was not even a student and I would go in there and go to the reference section and say, can I please look at this book or that book? And I'd find the card in the catalog. And I started studying all this stuff and I studied for 10 years. In 1987, I was sitting in the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee library in an alcove reading some kind of book. I was very awake. I never could sleep sitting up and I still can't. So whenever I fly. E even over, after the military? Yes. I can sleep standing up. I can sleep sitting down. I can sleep standing on one knee. Like it, it, it's, a, it's a problem <laughs> and it still is. Whenever I fly over to Europe, and I still do, that I'm awake all night and I listen to put my headphones on, I watch a movie, I eat their food, whatever. But the idea is that I've never slept once sitting up. So I was in the library there and all of a sudden I was somewhere else. I mean, one minute I'm reading a book and the next moment I am somewhere else and I am essentially sitting next to somebody who is in the driver's seat, but I seem to be on the side of them anyway, closer to the door. And it was like somebody else was controlling these thoughts and visions. I was really over there and I was no longer in my desk. And all of a sudden my vision changed and I was in front of this person and I did not look anything like me. I was 27 years old and whoever was driving looked to me like about 19 years old, but I looked into his eyes and the first thing I thought was, wow, that's me. It just came to me. I said, that's me. But it didn't look like me. This person had red hair, 19 years old, seemed to be taller than me. I'm 5'10". And next thing I know, there is some kind of crash. And I'm rolling out and down this road. It was like I went inside of this person's body. And the next thing I know, I uh, seem to be 25 feet in the air, maybe 30 feet in the air, something like that. I don't know. And I'm looking down at this body lying in the middle of the road. And I look over in the side and I see this truck that may have been from the 1940s, late 1930s. I'm not an expert on trucks, but just from the movies that I've seen, and I kind of guess that it's one of these older trucks, pickup truck type things. And the Model was, T looking thing, right? Yeah. And it was smoking. And so what had happened is this person had run into a rock on the side of the road and had flown out the driver's door and I'd flown out with them it was like I was rolling down this road and I'd roll in right out of my body. It was like I was this person and I'd roll in right out of my body and up. And so I was looking down and every blade of grass, I could see everything perfectly. There was no hand coming out of the sky. There was no light. There was no anything. All I noticed was the body in the ground. And also every blade of grass, because this was out in the rural area, clearly, that seemed to have a slight inner glow to it. It was very crystal clear and beautiful. But the first thing that came to my mind, Sean, was that I'm dead. Not a near-death experience of any kind. Not to put them down, because I think these things are real. But the idea that I knew right then and there, I said, I am dead. I almost thought again, but I, I didn't even get that far. The second thought that I had, this happened very quickly, was that I feel fine. That my personality had not changed at all. Now I'm up in the air, even though I could not see me having any body, I was simply 
had some kind of vision of this. There's a body lying motionless on the road that I seem to be completely disconnected from. And there was a truck over there that was smoking that had hit a big rock, an outcropping of rock. And that I was dead, for sure dead. And that I was also feeling just fine. I was kind of like, well, here we go again. Mm. You know, it really was like that. It was really matter of fact. It was like, well, I'm dead. And then all of a sudden, bang, I was back in my seat. And I thought. Do you think that was like a prior life or yes. something like that? Yes, I do. Okay. And I, I thought that at the time, too, because now I was a little smarter. I had done some studying about some of these things. And I thought, I think I just had kind of a past life experience, except for it was not directed by me. I was not studying this kind of thing. I remember the whatever book I was reading. I also read a lot of fiction and also nonfiction. And I don't remember which book I was reading, but it certainly wasn't a past life type book or anything. And so the first thing that occurred to me was that some spirit wanted me to know what it was like to die. This is the first thing that occurred to me when I was sitting back in the alcove of this library at the university by myself, that a spirit had wanted me to see what it was like to die. And that was really probably the first time that I'd really come that close to a spirit, even though I'd never seen one, where that somebody else had made something happen, a vision. So I thought it was just for me. So I mm -hmm. thought, well, now I know what it's like to die. I didn't f feel any pain. I probably broke my neck on the way out. And I remember hitting something on the way out. I still remember this is like it happened yesterday. And how can you forget? And that also the second thing I remembered was I feel exactly the same. I'm no longer connected to my body, but I feel just fine. And as soon as I thought that thought, I was back in the library in front of this book. I was not in any kind of distress. I was actually kind of grateful. I thought, well, at least I know that when I die, that I'm going to be okay. And I thought it was just about me. I had not started Star Clear yet for another four years. One thing so. that you said that was kind of funny and revealing is the here we go again. <laughs> it was. And hey. just when I was thinking that thought, that yeah. was the last thought that was coming into my mind when I simply returned to this desk consciously. It's like playing a video game there. and your character dies. You're like, uh, here we go again. <laughs> yeah, it was what I remember. The, the whole thought that I remember was first, I'm dead. And I almost kind of went again. It, it was like a familiarity type thing. And so it was uh, very familiar to me, too familiar. You know, mm -hmm. it was kind of like, wow, I'm dead. You know, there's no coming back. But I never got that far because the very next thought was, I feel fine. I had no thought changes at all. It was kind of like, well, I'm dead. I feel okay. I feel fine. I'm up here in the air somewhere. I'm not on the ground looking at this body. I'm up in the air looking down at this body, not from a great distance, but I felt it was something between 25 and 50 feet. I just don't know because I was the one who was up there and I just couldn't tell. I really wasn't looking down directly. I couldn't take my eyes off this body and the whole thing didn't last very long. And so when I returned to the library, it was just within a second. And I was just there and, I, and the book was still in my hand. And it was like, I thought, thanks. Because I thought what had happened was, because my whole life had been kind of weird. I mm -hmm. thought that it was simply my spirit guide saying, Jeffrey, you should know what happens when a person dies for your own personal reasons. So therefore you'll never fear death again. That's what I thought this whole thing was about. I was very wrong. That's what I thought at the time, though, why this had happened. I never so doubted what, what, the experience. I was not on any what, drugs. Just for the record here, I was not high on any drugs. I was not on any alcohol. I was completely sober. And so I never doubted this experience. It was so real. So what was it really about? Well, later on, what had happened was just three years later, uh, 1990, I had by accident run into this girl at a bar. 
And we kind of hit it off because she liked Star Trek and so did I. And she really liked Star Trek. She was going to the convention. She even had a uniform that turned out for these conventions. So she was really into Star Trek. And so we just kind of hit it off and we started dating and things. And it turned out that she actually was a, a professional psychic which she did not tell me right away, probably not to scare mm -hmm. me because I really didn't want anything to do with this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I thought that, you know, my life was okay. I was working. I didn't see any reason to talk to anybody about this because what had happened earlier in my life, why lose friends? Why? There's no reason for this. I didn't even talk to her about this stuff really. And so we went together for a while and I went over to her house and she had, said to me, I've been doing Ouija boards for 20 years with friends of mine. And it's the same group. And sometimes we have guests. And she said, would you like to attend a Ouija board session? And I said, well, let me think about it. And she actually was doing radio shows and stuff. And I didn't know that, but she was actually kind of popular in my hometown. I didn't know who she was, but she would go on the radio stations and talk about these things. She was a tarot reader mostly but she was also very psychic and and i found out how and why later on because i went with her for six years but so i i actually remember sitting in a bar before i went to this i said i was going to go and i was sitting in a bar and i was not drunk but i just had one drink and i said you know what i'm not, not going to go i'm going to break up with this woman i don't want to get involved in spirits i don't need this anymore because i don't want to lose any more friends I don't want my life to fall apart. I know there are spirits out there. I know there's life after death, but what does this have to do with me? I'll die someday and then I'll probably go to whatever, the next level, whatever it's going to be. I was not a religious person, but that I thought, well, I already know that there's life after death. And these are probably spirits I saw when I was young. And I think everything was just fine in my life. I don't need any more of this stuff. But I'd actually, while I was sitting there contemplating this and this, bar and just having one drink that the song invincible by pat benatar came on the jukebox mm -hmm. and i like pat benatar i like rock and roll i'm a rock and roll guy and i thought it was kind of unusual i said you know what maybe you should face your fears that was part of the lyrics of this song you know it was about facing fears and i said i kind of took it as a hint i said maybe you should go to this meeting in a half an hour this ouija board session and you don't have to participate. They said you can sit back from the table. As a matter of fact, they requested that. Their table was already, big round table was already filled up. They did it every week, turned out. So I went to this, I said, you know what? I'm going to go. Why not just go to one and see what this is all about? I don't really want to talk to spirits. They seem to be able to talk to me. This is what happened a couple of years ago. And so I thought, you know, well, why not? So I went to this Ouija board session and I sat back from this table. And there were probably about seven or eight people sitting back as well who were guests. And I was one of them. And after they went through their thing, and I was paying attention, but I was also maybe a little bored in a way. I, I don't know. I was sitting back and I don't know if this stuff is real or not as far as what they were doing. But they said, is anybody sitting back have a question? And it came my turn. And I said, okay, is there any messages for me? I said, from the spirits. And they did their thing. And my girlfriend at the time was operating this and one of her friends, two people should be operating a planchette, as they call it, thing going around the Ouija mm -hmm. board, as I learned later on. And so a message did come back from me, it spelled out something pretty quickly. And it said, Jeffrey, you need to cut down on the sugar. And I was blown away because what nobody knew, including my girlfriend at the time, there's no reason to tell her. I had not known her all that well, that I had gone to my doctor that afternoon for a regular checkup. And one of the things he said to me exactly that was a quote was Jeffrey, you need to cut down on the sugar. And I was like, what? How none of these people even know I went to the doctor, much less that I had said anything to these people. I'd walked in, there was already a group there. And I would not even tell my girlfriend normally something like that. You know, wh why? It was just a regular thing. 
I was pretty well taken. I said, well, maybe they are talking to somebody who knows a spirit of some kind or spirits. There seemed to be spirits. They were talking with different people about different things, different spirits, I should say. And so it perked my interest. And so I started to go to these things on a regular basis. And before I knew it, I was the one sitting next to my girlfriend at the table with my hand in the planchette. Because I told them about my history then. I said, I'm psychic. I don't know everything. I don't know the future. I don't know this and that, but I can see things. And I've been studying things over the last eight years since getting out of the Air Force. And so what had happened was, was that uh, some of the people there were psychics and some were just like attorneys and writers and all sorts of things. And uh, a message came over the board because two of these people were having problems. One was a psychic who was seeing people out of her home and she was evidently a very good one. And also the other person was a writer and they were having a problem getting rid of some problems in the writer's apartment and the psychic's home. And the message that came over the board was, ask Jeffrey to go in and take a look at this. And I thought, well, I guess, and I did. And for some reason, I knew what to do and I don't even know how. I simply went in there and I started to move energy. I kind of put my hands up and started to move energy. And nobody taught me how to do that. It was very weird. I walked into this writer's apartment and I started to walk around and kind of like push things. I could always kind of see emotional energy. It was visible to me. It was not intelligent energy, but almost like, say, smoke in the air. And so I could see it when I was young in the classrooms. I could actually visually see it. And so I just didn't pay much attention to it. And so the problem was gone, he said. After two years of these people working on it and going over to his apartment, and trying to get rid of this thing, they couldn't do it. He felt there was a spirit in the apartment and I could see something in there as well. I just kind of like pushed with my energy and this thing took off and never mm -hmm. returned. And so the next thing that happened was this professional psychic, not my girlfriend, but the professional psychic, she said, will you come over to my house? Cause I see a lot of clients over there and I got something over there and I can't get rid of it neither can this group and the whole group knew about it and they said yeah just go over whatever worked you did and so i went over to this girl's house this woman's house and did the same thing problem solved it was gone and i was surprised i seemed to know what to do inherently i had never studied what to do there was mm -hmm. no books written on how do you get rid of negative spirits? I mean, there were some books about exorcism out there and things like that. I didn't really feel all that interested in it. Like, what did that have to do with me? I felt, look, I knew I was psychic by then. I knew I was psychic in high school. I knew I was different. I said, look, you're just lucky that nothing weird is happening in your life of a negative nature. Mm -hmm. Nobody's attacking you. You know, if, if anything, it's a benefit. You can, you know, when trouble's coming, and hence, I never got caught doing anything. Right. And so what happened was I went back to these Ouija board sessions and it kind of came to me through these Ouija board sessions. And, you know, I put my hand in this thing and I could tell that she was not moving this. The thing actually was moving by itself. So I figured, you know, OK, these are spirits. I could actually see their hands sometimes touch our energy fields around our arms and push our arms. It was really weird. And I found it very fascinating. I went to a couple hundred of them over a course of several years. But anyways, this happened all very quickly. And one of the messages that came through was Jeffrey really should, and also from the people, that you need to take this to the public. You have some kind of talent. We tried for two years and we're good at this kind of stuff. Some of these people were psychic, although they were not professional psychics, but they couldn't get rid of the problems. And you walk in and in one shot, you got rid of the problems. And even the Ouija boards were spelling out, Jeffrey, you should take this to the public. And I thought, well, OK. And I saw I remember that I went down to a local regional newspaper, not at the time the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, which was the big newspaper, but a, a smaller newspaper that was sort of a local concert type newspaper type thing. And it's still kind of famous. And so 
when I was going down to put the ad in, and I don't know if I spoke about this in my books or not. I think I might have in my first book, but when my girlfriend, we only had one car, she had to take the car to work. She was a secretary for a very popular attorney and very successful she was. And at night she would do readings for people and she would go to psychic fairs and she was good. And I remember when I took the bus down to downtown Milwaukee that I felt like I was on fire. It was something I could not explain to this day. I felt like I was burning up. I didn't feel like I had a fever. I simply felt like my whole body had turned to flame and it happened as soon as I got on the bus and I was not on any drugs or any alcohol. It was a $15 advertisement. You put something, a few words in the box, and that's all you get for the week. And I had thought on the way down, the one thought that did come to me besides this incredible feeling is somebody just had injected me with something, but they had not. And I thought to myself, I am doing the most important thing in my life that I'll ever do. I said, what I'm doing, every step that I take closer to this little office, where I hand them $15 in this little box with a few words in it, that I'm doing something that would have an effect for the rest of my life, that every step that I take was important. And I walked in this office feeling like I was on fire. That's all I can explain this mentally, physically, like everything I, I was doing was like about winning $10 million. It was like somebody just told me I had won the lottery or something. It was like, they didn't know anything. I didn't give anything away, but it was just kind of mm -hmm. like, I was going through this motion type thing. Here's the $15, that's exactly how much it was. Here's my piece of paper in the box. I even wrote, wrote a box on this blank piece of paper and the words, I got a certain amount of words. And here you go. And I was like, I was just on fire. And I said, I'm doing the most important thing that I've ever done in my life. And I walked out of the office and I, I didn't even go to the bus stop. I just kept on walking. I said, I don't know what's going on. And it just simply had worn off after about maybe five or six blocks of walking down the street in downtown Milwaukee that I started to feel normal again. And I didn't really get any business from this thing. Nobody had called me. And so what had happened was that I didn't get any business. What had happened was two things. One, the paper itself took an interest in me. At that time, mm -hmm. my girlfriend was kind of involved in this. She wanted to be involved in this, even though she didn't like doing what I call clearings or exorcisms. She didn't like doing that stuff. She was capable of it but she really preferred to do what she was really good at, which was telling people things about themselves that they didn't know, and also things that would happen to them in the future. She was so good, she could tell somebody, meet somebody and tell them their middle name. I mean, she was really interesting, a very nice person, but I'll say this very quickly, that I went with her for six years and lived with her. She was so good, I was working for a cable company, I was not, running around and selling cable, but I had a better job and I was in charge of apartment buildings in a section of Milwaukee. And very often I'd stop at a bar. I don't drink anymore, but back then I was in my early thirties and I'd stop at bars and do paperwork and stuff. And that was kind of the Milwaukee culture back then. And when I came home, she knew exactly where I had been. And I would go to different places every day. She could tell me exactly where I had been. She could tell me what music I played in the jukebox. Was she having me followed? Which would be the logical thing somebody would think listening to this show? No. Because I was driving around in my own personal van. And at the time I bought a van and it was like, I was not using their equipment as far as her vehicles. I belonged to a special group. And mm -hmm. I was using my own personal stuff and no, I was not being followed and she was not following me. I even asked her that. I said, are you following me? How do you know where I was? How do you know what music I was, the very songs I was listening to? She goes, little birdies told me. Oh, I said, oh, them. And I just looked up at the sky and then when she told me that, I said, thank you. 
And I said, <laughs> there goes my privacy. Not that I was doing anything wrong. I wasn't. I was mm -hmm. not flirting with women. I was not doing anything. I might have a beer or something like that. And I was doing my paperwork and also answering the telephones that the cell phones had just come out. So I'd be talking on the telephone and all of that with clients for a cable company. But she knew what, the songs that I, I played in the jukebox. And I was like, wow. I said, thanks a lot. I said, gee, you don't have to tell her everything. But she just said, I know you're not doing anything wrong, Jeffrey. I completely trust you. I know you're not doing anything wrong. You're not flirting with women. You're not doing anything. You're just going out to this bar and this bar and this bar. You were there for 45 minutes. You played this two songs. You had two beers. And I was like, wow. I said, you are good. And so that's kind of how the whole thing started. And what had happened was the newspaper itself had taken an interest in me. If nobody else did in a little tiny box in the back of the paper, the newspaper did. I didn't get any phone calls at first. The newspaper took an interest in me and said, hey, can we do an article about you? And also her as well, because she was part of this at the same time. And I said, sure. And so why not? And so it turned out to be like a three page article with the front cover as well. And it was my first time I ever had my picture taken by the media. And I was terrified. And so that attracted some attention and it attracted the attention of a Marquette business graduate who was interested in this kind of subject. And he called me up and he said, I would like to become your business manager and I'll do it for free. Because I really like this subject and what you're trying to do. And he actually mm -hmm. got me some jobs. And so that's kind of how the whole thing started. And then I put an ad into the Yellow Pages at the time, which was actually a paper book for those of you who right. are a little younger. And that also attracted some attention. And what had finally happened was, was that I started to do some work and I was only doing hard things at the time, meaning people would call me up who felt that there were spirits in their apartment, home or business. I was not doing just general clearings as I am as well right now. By general clearings, you mean somebody just buys a house and you just come in and clear it much. I, I, I mean, I had different, learned, but, yes, yeah. I had learned to answer your question. I had learned by going in there looking for spirits that there seemed to be an awful lot of negative emotional energy in these homes and businesses because I could see it kind of like a cloud in these parts of these homes. And I would do my thing and then the energy would be pushed out. And so what I learned was that it wasn't always just negative spirits or even negative spirits at all, but actually sometimes what people thought were spirits were just really intense pockets of emotional energy from probably past tenants as a lot of these homes and businesses were old. The buildings were old. And these were not the first tenants, not a lot of new construction in the city of Milwaukee really going on. It was like these older homes. Milwaukee was an older city and still is, you know, it's an older place. And so what had happened was that three women, young women in their 20s who had a three bedroom condominium right outside of Milwaukee had complained, had called me and complained about seeing shadows pass before the shower curtain and waking up with an indentation in their beds. They had three separate bedrooms. And all of them were like 22 or so, and they all had different jobs and they all were friends had gone in on a, probably on a rental of a condo. I, I didn't really know. And at the time I had been speaking with the only television show that was on in America, it was called sightings. It was back in the 1990s. And it was the only show that was on relating to psychic ability and spirits and all of that. It was on late at night. It was the show. And I had actually written them and just generally about my business. And are you interested at all in any of this? And they said, well, what are you working on? And I said, well, I'm working. I can't tell you where it is and what I'm doing, but I'm going to be doing a clearing in a few days. And I told them the story of these three women and they were terrified. You can imagine, you know, you're a young woman and you're taking a shower and you look and there are shadows passing back and forth behind the shower curtain. They were frightened. 
And so they said, you know, I was due to go there in a few days. And they said, wow, this is really interesting. What's their number or something, whatever, you know? And I said, I can't give you that. And I can't do that to them. And I said, maybe I can get them to call you. And I'll ask them. And what happened was, was that I said, look, sightings, which everybody knew, they said they would like to film this. <laughs> and they said, well, we wouldn't be adverse to that, but we can't wait for any cameras to come out. This problem has to end. So I kind of lucked out in that way. I mean, it's kind of hard to get people to want this kind of thing filmed. It kind of reduces the property value. And so they said, well, you would let that happen. We're familiar with the show, but we're not going to put back the clearing. You've got to come out here and help us. All right, let's stop right here and then use that as the place to start the next episode in terms of what happened next. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit like and subscribe and also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now, and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than giving me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon. And just go to either site and it'll explain everything. third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site, which is here. There's plenty of stuff that you could get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and you can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel. And I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link. The channel gets a cut of that, and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates Club. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because it's more of an expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, there's two options. There's Buy Me A Coffee, which is a separate site, and there's also you can go through YouTube with either a Super Chat, a Super Sticker, or a Super Thanks. Again, I prefer Buy Me A Coffee because that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you, you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.